Have you ever heard a jump? A jump is violent. The atmos splitting, eardrum rupturing, gravity rending crack of the drop from hyperspace is like standing under the strike of a thunderbolt. That which was not, is. The materializing matter cannot occupy the same points as the particles currently inhabiting the three dimensional space, and so sends them rocketing outward, not accelerating. It sends them outward as close to instantaneously as physics can currently measure. The shockwave contains enough kinetic energy to pulverize structures of both manufactured alloy and biological flesh. Within a few short meters, anything less than ion shielded durasteel will kindle as easily as a struck match. A jump is audible even in the void. It shouldn't be possible. Sound doesn't travel where there is no atmo to carry it. But what's one more? When a jump already breaks a dozen physical laws of the natural world. Because a jump isn't natural. It starts with a boom. It always does. A distant, faded detonation like huddling behind a bunker as an EOD tech disposes of captured ordnance with a block of C4. Maybe you'll notice it, maybe not. Hopefully your sensors will let you know if you're not paying attention. That's the calibration jump, the stutter, the downshifting of the warp drives to recalculate their coordinates in reality. No way to know how much juice left in the drives, 60 seconds at most. Get your armor on and make sure your active hearing protection is working. Would be a shame if you were just a sack of skin after this, filled with a soup of internal organs and pulped bone matter. The next part happens fast. So fast most think it's one sound, but it's not. Pay attention. Operation X Day, Xeno Day. The fifth largest single landing ground assault in the history of the settled galaxies. 8.6 million Terran Marines packed into enough carriers to eclipse the enemy homeworlds. Six or eight more waves behind us. Our Hail Mary. Last chance, win now, or thanks for playing. We don't hold this beachhead. The oceans back on Earth boil. Ash to ash, sand to glass. The abrupt perspective shift from traveling toward a planet to straight down is disorienting. I'd already used my anti-nausea pills on the jump-in. Couldn't have kept them down anyway. Didn't dare let go of my rifle. You don't hear anything if you're the one riding the jump. It's weird. I remember seeing a fade's world, dark gray. Just dark gray from the shrapnel rain of the gun runs, low-level saturation bombing for the last six months. Then we started seeing flashes in the smoke, beautiful, like fireflies in the mist. But each flash was a plasma bolt from the anti-aircraft batteries. My pilot had hit the mark. Others weren't so lucky. Come in too high, and orbital defenses shredded the carriers before the you're done retching from the jump. Come in too low, and the guns on the surface did the same thing. Come in just right, and they told us we had a 70% chance of getting boots on the ground. Right before you hit, everything floats. The artigrav coming online to prevent the landing from driving your femurs through your chest cavity. I saw the guys in front for an instant. They were drowning victim white. Then the ramps drop it. We drilled for hundreds of hours. Get off the dropships. Run as fast and as far as you can. Make way for those behind. Push forward. Protect the Marines. Our advance ranks evanesced, vaporized, disintegrated like the casing of a nuclear bomb stripped to its component atoms by the energy yield. Push through a wall of plasma fire so thick it could have been solid fortifications. Push through thorned vegetation that shredded flesh as easily as clothing. Push through the mire of blood and earth, boots slipping in the molten entrails of the first six down the ramps. Push through the ragdoll corpses, through the choking haze of smoke, through the screams and sweat and fear, past the slow and the fades, past the dropships, falling from the sky like shooting stars, past our own slagged armor, past the first of the artillery strikes as they found their range, past the cremation chambers of troop carriers ignited by the anti-air batteries, past the first of the biobombs and cytotoxic gas, past a hundred thousand soldiers never going home, to the fast and the living, to the lucky, to the cover they promised us was out there, to the only chance of surviving, to our destruction, to our dissolves, to humanity's end, to engage at close range with an elite combat species, 
Someone had made a mistake. Someone had calculated wrong. Someone had pressed the button to murder every single one of us. Fear so thick you could taste it through the smog. Rage like wildfire against the high command who'd sent us to dissolutions. Icy calm at the end of a lifetime of war. Glance to the right at my brother of specie. To my left at my brother of blood. A half smile on his face. We'll make this. Just keep up. Stim dumps like liquid fire through our veins. Outstripping the non-enhanced because our job was to protect the Marines. Get there first and punch a hole. Because the Marines didn't have a chance. Protect the Marines. CQC against an elite combat species. Augmented speed and strength to protect the Marines. The last best hope for the non-enhanced. Kept up as our shock troops closed into CQC with an elite combat species. Kept up into hand-to-hand -hand melee against the design of a world's evolution. The enemy closed for the dissolutions. The noose around a convict's throat. Artillery found the range. Anti-aircraft emplacements rent the sky. Flak batteries curtained the heavens with steel splinters. Lungs burned in the gas and the biobombs stripped flesh from bone. On the edge of the void, planetary defenses angled their cannons. Orbital bombardment to mop up the last pathetic hope for humanity. Ash to ash. Sand to glass. Let the oceans boil. That's when I heard it. Most people think it's one sound. But it's not. Are you paying attention? First are the skull-jarring impacts of a Mechase II mass driver. Because while the destroyer is still in the jump, still stalking her prey behind the veil of hyperspace, the sensor packages are reaching through the higher planes, stepping down, putting a single toe over the line into the reel. Sensors designed to function where radar and lidar can't, where the laws of physics break and space-time warps into the irrational, magicked into existence by Terran engineers to interface with the wetware processors of the crew, to chew through data, gnaw through equations of relative velocity, lead time, and drop, spitting out targeting solutions to the rail gunners, plugged into the computers through 90 million worth of neuron-like input and output cyberwares. Seeing what the computers see so Terran gray matter can be used to calculate firing solutions in the real while still within the unreal. 1,500 kilograms of Terran manufactured ordnance slung out of the jump at 0.1% C. Depleted uranium slugs on the business end of a physics equation that sums to an effect on target measured in grid squares. That's the step. Then it goes quiet. So fleeting most don't remember it. Look at a waveform recording. The complete absence of sound for the smallest fraction of an instant. Like the universe is holding its breath for the miracle that is about to happen. Dragging in a single lungful of Atmo in preparation for the plunge. The drop. The destroyer, the pinnacle of the Terran War Machine, an apex predator of the Void, drop it from hyperspace into CQB operations like the hammer blow of a gravity forge, 55 million kilograms of Durasteel armor, mass driver gunhouses, chain gun emplacements, missile batteries, torpedo tubes, and CWS networks deployed into combat from anywhere in the Versa. The sum total of Terran Force projection capabilities realist in three-dimensional space, rendered like a computer grinding through a stress test. The crack of atmospheric displacement is otherworldly, driven into my chest like I'd taken the brunt of a torpedo strike. The shockwave quenches fires on the surface, flattens waves of marines into the mud. Drive engines seethe with a crimson roar as she yaws sideways. Servo mechanisms traverse guns to their targets, Mass driver capacitors reach operational threshold, and the personification of the Terran industrial military complex has assumed her overwatch of the last best hope of the human species. Stutter. Step. Drop. Energy cannons just don't do it like jump-slung railguns. I'm Ethan Wells. I was born in a place that used to be called New York. No, not the city. Way too much residual radiation. An HZ West. My first deployment was... Childhood? I didn't have one. The Shriek stole the childhoods of the past generations and burned Earth so the next childhood won't be for another century. I was taught to fire a rifle at four. How to throw a grenade at five. 
trapped and hunted more food than I was given by seven or eight. By nine, I could tell you the three most efficient ways to dissolutions a shriek. Through the eye, under the arm, through the groin. I grew up in an entire world at war. I'm one of the few who still remembers the occupation, the genetic casts and mandatory DNA sequencing, the reprisals that dissolutions both my parents, the research farms, the holding pens full of human animals waiting their turn. I remember the screams of the dissidents during brutal suppression tactics. I remember public executions of the undesirable. I remember tattoos on every arm. I remember hiding with my brother as Shrike warriors scented the air for us. I grew up in a world being strip mines for its resources. Not the resources of Atmo and water and minerals. It's resources of organic matter. They wanted us, humans. They wanted our biology. One of the first actions of the rebellion was a black op strike against some research facility. It was intended to assassinate officers, but found instead an info dump of scientific records. Human DNA is moddable. Gene splicing, bioediting, genetic engineering, cyberware, wetware. We're unique. Special. Other Xenos built better machines. The Shriek thought they could build a better Shriek as if they needed another advantage. High-grav combat species already have every advantage. And guess what's the easiest way to play with genetic codes? Get a Terran child. Younger than four, so epigenetics have the greatest potential and the brain is at its highest plasticity. You want to know what the most specific memories of my childhood are? Being separated from my brother so the harvesters wouldn't reap us. Filtered respirators during the bioweapon strikes staring through radiation shielding at the burnt sky, trying to imagine if it was blue like I'd been told it used to be, trying to imagine more than singular children gathered in the remaining HZs. But the sky is burnt and the children are gone. I tried to imagine a lifetime without all-encompassing war. We recruited volunteers to experiment with NervoThread, shriek tech that wove filaments into the nervous system in a surgery barely kinder than vivisection ultimately allowing biology to communicate with silicon. They'd been testing it on specially selected human subjects for the last few months before the uprisings. The first wave ended up disabled or fades, but a few of the next one made it. Someone used their link-ups to reverse-engineer the OS of a water pump, then a shriek computer, then a slagged ship. We stumbled across a database of stellar coordinates figured out how to mirror an FTL drive, and turned it on after we built it. When it didn't work, we fixed it. After we fixed it, we discovered the Xeno reliance on pre-existing jump points and relay stations to shield ships' passage through the FTL lanes. But we didn't need hyperlanes, because we could jump, the single greatest tactical advantage within the settled galaxies. Dematerializing at one point in existence, and materializing at another. Terran technological and scientific advancement reshaping reality itself, inconsiderate of the physical laws of both space and time. A wormhole anywhere to anywhere. The closest thing to omnipresence our three dimensions will ever know. We knew the Shrieky wouldn't falter next time. Their harvests of our kind had already slowed before we drove them back. They'd take the last bit they wanted and glass the world if they ever returned to our system. But the desire to survive is hardwired. The desire for vengeance. I grew up in a planetary munitions factory. A radiation-seared hellscape of a world. A forge of fodder for the first contact war. An all-encompassing war machine. Every human, Terran, a cog in that machine. It was a machine that manufactured durasteel and synthiglass. Ball bearings and rubber. Polymer. Ceramics. Tungsten. Drive engines. Ion shielding, mass drivers, body armor and kinetic rifles to mass-produce soldiers, fuel cells and depleted uranium to construct ships, soldiers and ships to forge armies, armies built on a never-ceasing production line of flesh and ordnance. The day we came of age was clear, a rare break in the dust storms. Brothers weren't allowed to serve together, something about preventing another saving Private Ryan. Neither of us knew who Ryan was separated since birth because of the enemy, and now separated by our own. I was sworn into the Marines, in front of the new Terran flag. 
I don't remember what the oath was like in those days. Didn't really matter. First time in human... Terran history all of humankind was united, and it was to swear absolute, unconditional genocide against another species. Probably some deeper meaning in that. I caught my brother just before the red sun descended below the horizon. What are your orders? He lifted his face to the sun's last rays, filtered a scorched orange through the radiation shielding. Mars, he said. I'm jumping to Mars. Gonna be a mechanic. I opened my mouth to speak again, but he cut me off. It's all right. That half-smile on his face. What about you? What did you get? I didn't find out till after I watched his troop transport jump away. After that crack as the pocket of absolute nothingness collapsed in on itself in the absence of a transport. After that resounding, concussive noise like the ceiling of a mausoleum. Didn't find out until he was already in the thick of it. After he'd seen beyond the jump, Basic was harsh, brutal bordering on sadistic. Instructors who had fought during the occupation and knew firsthand what the Shriek could do. Old men cunning and ruthless enough to have survived a rebellion against an elite combat species, emerging on the other side with the guile of old wolves and the ropey scars of Shriek talons. They taught us one thing above all else. Range. Range was our ally our only ally. The Shriike, they screamed at us during the live-fire drills, are an elite combat species. If they get within ten meters of you, you are fades. If they get into the same room as you, you are fades. If they see you before you see them, you are fades and Terra burns. They have better senses than you and more of them. They can see thermal signatures in the dark, and their sense of smell is a hundred times better than your own. They can hear your heartbeat and the one that stuck with all of us recruits the most, less because of what was said but more because of the way it was said. A Shriek warrior can stop a pain response as easily as you choose to hold your breath. It doesn't matter what injuries you inflict, there will be plenty of time for it to rip you and your platoon apart before its brain realizes that it's supposed to be fades. Your rifle's maximum effective range is 1,200 meters. It's a shame yours isn't. My brother went to the gun runs, to be entombed in flying steel coffins above eight metric ton deliveries of general-purpose demolition bombs, low-level saturation bombing of the enemy homeworlds. Six in ten didn't make it past eight missions. My first jump was to Sol 4, the staging area for the consolidated might of the Terran war machine. I could see the ordnance dumps in the munitions depots and the troop carriers moored in the harbors, taste the smog of durasteel mills and fuel cell refineries, Hear the otherworldly crack of the jumps as our carriers softened up hard targets. Preparations for ground assault. Before our few destroyers and warp-sickened crews were unable to hold back the Shriek fleets. Ethan. I turned to see a man who looked like my brother. A man with eyes who had seen beyond the jump. Who had struggled with the enemy in the atmo of distant worlds. A man with a polymer cheekbone and ghoulish scarring across the side of his face finally pulling his favorite expression into permanence. Flack burst inside the ball turret of a marauder heavy bomber during the last run. Jumped back not because of the wound, but because the Terran navy was strained to the breaking point, both flesh and alloy fatigued like over-flexed iron. Combat veterans needed for ground assault. Invasion now, or surrender later. Before the smokescreen of jumps is waved away, and the Shrike realize how few warships Terra commands. I stood frozen, afraid if I moved it would break the hallucination, and I cried as the bomber gunner clasped the back of my neck and pulled my forehead against his own. It's all right, Ethan. We'll make this. That night in the common quarters, I watched him interact with the scattering of others still awake, mechanics and infantry and supply dock workers. Drawn to his burning eyes and scarred face, kept by his wit and easy friendliness. He didn't speak about the war that night. I think he knew I needed him not to, because he had fout and I had not. Because the only thing I needed to hear him say about the gun runs was, I had a good navigator. And when finally the simple jokes and grim laughter were spent, I watched him leave the dispersing huddle and approach where I sat on the floor against the wall. There was a girl with him, with cropped hair and void dark eyes that had seen beyond the jump, ports at the base of her skull and behind her ear, 
This is Aisha, he told me. She's a gunner on Charon's Repoman, rotating out to recover from warp sickness. This is Ethan, he told her. He's a Marine. Hi, she said. Hi, I said. Gladiator class? She nodded, and I turned back to my brother. Go. Then I echoed his words back. I'll be all right. The next morning, some civvy in a suit found me and told me my brother had lied to me. The flak hit had laid him up in some phobi hospital hidden way, out in the middle of nowhere void space. A blood transfusion or something had blipped up on some sort of genetic marker tracking database, so they jumped him back to Sol 3. They were using the scraps of Shrike research to delve into combat stimulants. Some sort of program codenamed Iron Man. He volunteered immediately good little soldier that he was. The civvy told me everything they tried on him worked. Everything. The civvy told me the chemical dumps in my brother's bloodstream would give him a chance against the Shriek during the ground assault. The civvy didn't need to tell me why I'd been sought out next. The next time I saw my brother, a few hours later, I threw a punch. I hit him, broke a finger, split the skin over his polymer cheekbone. I stared at the floor for a long time. He let me think for a long time. It's all right, Ethan. I had everything to say, nothing to say. Nothing I voiced would matter to him. He was had always been absolute, assured, right and wrong, black and white. I'm going to be on that first wave, Ethan. It's got to be me because it's got to be someone. I need you to keep up. I stared into his eyes, at his mutilated face, the permanent half-smile. All right. I never asked you, he replied. How's it feel to still be the ugly one? So I kept up, through the clinical trials and the prodding chemists, through the medical workups and the genetic analysis, past the psyche vols, past the physical tests, to the first of the enhanced soldiers in the Terran Marines, to the first dropships to impact the surface of Kogshokad, the largest of the three Shriek homeworlds. Just before the drop, while our carriers were still on the other side, one of the other enhanced shared a pack of smokes. It'll stop the jitters during the stim dumps. You ever heard a jump? You don't hear anything if you're the one riding it. Just the intensifying thunder of the jump drives spooling up before you go, because when that otherworldly crack finally happens, you aren't there anymore. I just heard the shriek of flak bursts when we dropped. My first deployment was on Kog Shokad. During the fifth largest ground assault in galactic history, my first deployment was under the overwatch of a Reaper class Mekoda III, serial number 60106 of the 1st Terran Assault Fleet, 3rd Heavy Destroyer Command. She who is called Lucky 13, Avenger and Guardian. Her navigator dropped her close enough to the surface we could see the non-regulation white of the feathered wings painted on her hull, dripping with crimson. The shouts came ragged at first. Spread swelled, rose into the smoke smothered atmo. Her call sign chanted into the ski she ruled. It's the Angel. The Angel. It's the Fallen Angel. The chant turned to roars and screams and threats, turned to a clamor of defiance that rivaled the thunderbolt of her railguns. Stutter. Step. Drop. And our angel was joined by her sister, Hecate, who had been the one to make the Dralgo skip and had torn out the spine of adamant dominion with her uranium teeth. The two destroyers held their overwatch for over an hour, held a shield of railgun and point defense over our heads for a thousand meters before us as we surged forward. Against surface and void alike, hell-bent of ripping them from the sky, winged durasteel leviathans, whose breath was the tracer ribbons of point defense and roar the strike of railguns. X-Day has evolved into myth and legend. More stories of heroism and bravery than could be told in a lifetime. More strategy and planning that could be recounted to give it the justice it deserves. More sacrifice by the ones who dropped. I can tell you, though, that when the nav computers were examined later, it was found that between the two destroyers, 47 jumps had been made that day, with physical and mental performance degrading each time from warp sickness. It's nearly unbelievable. Me? I don't care if it's true. The crack of those jumps remains the most beautiful sound in the void. I know those crews assured the fate of the Terran. The Angel and Hecate are the first and only CQB aces in Terran history. 
Those are the ships that infamously refused missile and torpedo armament. Their memo to the high command was something like, if we're not close enough for the rail guns, we're not close enough. But on the surface of that alien world, range was our only ally. My brother and I stood under the hastily fabricated shield domes and mobile point defense networks. We stared over the carnage, over the wreckage of slagged ships and twisted flesh, over the horrific price that had been paid, over the task that had finally dulled, dissolved scythe. I swayed, steadied for a moment. Exhaustion that sapped the soul from my bones. I lit a cigarette with nerveless fingers, had to pause a moment to remember how to inhale, dropped the lighter to the ground when I missed my pocket, felt the blinding pain of the migraine ease, I struggled to remember how long I could go without a mask before oxygen toxicity began to damage my alveoli. Couldn't follow that train of thought to a conclusion. I stared as the great tracked dozers cleared the hecatomb of blood and steel, pushing fleets of troop carriers and battalions of soldiers into the burn pits, easier to account for the living than to number the fades. My legs gave out under me. My brother fumbled to catch me landing on his knees in the mire of blood and earth as I fell. I stared upward at the shields as another salvo of artillery impacted above our heads. The energy blasts were muffled, far quieter than their kinetic counterparts. Looked like the sky was falling as the impacts bloomed over the dome, flaring it blue into the visible spectrum. I stared at the dropships entering the shield gates. Lives beyond reckoning, fed to the gnashing teeth of the Terran war machine, lives encased in fleshly forms far more fragile than my own, soft, slow biology against an elite combat species. The weight of my armor threatened to crush my lungs and stop my heart as I lay there, an ignoble end to one of Terra's finest. It wasn't the weight, it was the tiredness. My brother got a foot under him, made a slight effort to rise, then stopped, just kneeling in the center of the chaos of the Terran war machine as it strove to devour another world. I stared past his disfigured face at the helicopters thudding through the Atmo, deploying howitzers on the western ridge. The wind shifted, carrying with it the feeder of plasma-burned skin and the screams of the wounded in the field hospitals. Dull, but not broken. Dissolves had work yet to do. There was an ache in my left shoulder. It hadn't been feeling right. Pretty sure I'd smashed it against the dropship coming down the ramp. My brother undid the straps securing his armor, and the ballistic plates fell away from him. He shivered once as the wind stroked cold fingers across the exposed moisture of his sweat and others' blood. What now? I coughed the words through my burning throat. I noticed deep scores across the armor over my thigh, had a disjointed memory of a Shrike warrior punching talons toward me the thudding blow that glanced off the angled plates, but still threw me, spinning, into the air, remembered putting a shot through its chest, the roaring fangs as it came at me again. I flexed my quad experimentally, and the agony pried a groan between my teeth. My brother turned toward me, shriek blood crusted sullen red across his hand and forearm. From over the horizon came the crump of shelling, in the darkening sky, I could see the glow of he ordnance on a high-oxy world. We protect the Marines. The cigarette had burned down to my lips. They're Marines just like us. My brother stood finally. His voice was brittle. We're gifted. I hated that word. Heard it too many times. Not my fault. He whirled toward me, the ghastly scars across his face terrifying under the blue ripples of the ion shielding. Neither is it theirs. I felt the heat of the cigarette against my mouth, burning like my brother's eyes. Neither is it mine. Neither is it the shrieks. I couldn't hold his gaze. The eyes that had seen beyond the jump. Same eyes I had now. They, he stabbed a blood-covered hand toward the distant horizon, toward the flashes of the he bombardment. Those creatures are gifted too. I could see the tattoo, dark under the enemy blood smeared over his forearm. Eleven numbers in Shriek's script. I couldn't meet the gaze of the enhanced who stood over me. I'm staying on that first wave, Ethan. It's gotta be someone, so it's gotta be me. 
Are you going to keep up? I couldn't meet his eyes. Just looked at the outstretched hand. The cigarette burned. The weight of my armor threatened to crush my chest. Another plasma strike sapped the shields over my head. The desire to survive is hardwired. I heaved myself up, flicking the smoldering stub away. But when I reached for my brother's hand, something was wrong. Muscles that didn't obey my nerves and a shoulder joint that didn't track properly. A sob tore from my throat as my brother tried to pull me to my feet. Fresh blood pooled in my armor as I lay, flooded down my side, bright against the crusted gore. Have you ever heard a jump? A jump is the sound of shouting medics as you drift in and out of consciousness, dropping from hyperspace as the docs try to keep you from respirating your own vomit, screaming as the pain of your injuries finally overtakes the dregs of the combat stims, the sound of your brother raging against being left behind as you're transported to a fob hospital way out in the middle of nowhere void space, because you're an investment that's far too valuable to leave unrepaired. Kogshakad had been pretty once, lots of purple, but it was gray now, from the gun runs and from the boots of marines. We sought to flood it red. The otherworldly crack thudded into my chest. I grunted and dragged in a replacement lungful of scorched Atmo, involuntarily ducking as another Valar dual rotor thundered overhead, low and fast above the ruins. The distant crump of bombardment, shelling the far side of this once megalopolis, provided a bass backdrop for the snap of rifles a few blocks distant. Above me I could see the glitter of plasma cannons in the darkening sky. Eight reapers playing tag with the better part of a shriek fleet on the edge of the void. We were a couple clicks into the city. Alpha Company, 1st Platoon. My brother in front, me behind. Staggered column of non-enhanced between us. Echo Company had been tasked to secure an FSB somewhere in this grid square. Slag-brained Earthers had not only failed to set up an FSB, but had failed to make their rendezvous. Alpha first sent to babysit them back. My brother raised his fist, and the Marines fanned out into cover against the lavender-marbled white concrete the Xenos built everything load-bearing out of. I spun to check our six. The city had been raised, nothing but shards of lilac stone like reaching fingers. The tallest remaining structure in our grid square was a monolithic skyscraper that had collapsed sideways, leaving the spire-like foundation scarce ten meters tall. At one time, it could have housed the population of the drive yards on Sol 4. Now, it was an empty shell. The walls permeated with empty windows like blank eyes, watching impassively. Another crack split the air, this one closer, the shockwave sending fine powder into the air on the blast. A marine coughed, and I winced in annoyance as it spiked the pain in my skull. The sound of the cough was high and piercing in comparison. We'd been on a stim drip for seven hours. Overtuned senses made the distant fires too bright, and the stench of plasma burns nauseating. Active hearing protection inadequate against those constant low-level jumps. They'd been doing it for the past few hours. Troop transports jumping at a range short enough they didn't need the calibration stutter. Just a few clicks, or even less, to shovel hordes of Terran soldiers forward of the front lines, advancing faster than the surface bound. Shriek could react. Injecting Terran soldiers just behind any defensive perimeter the Xenos attempted to establish. Keeping the enemy reeling back. Well, that was the idea, anyway. I slapped at the pocket by my knee. Empty. I swore under my breath, swept my gaze over the slagged city around me. It had been beautiful once. Decorated. Maybe a capital, larger than anything back on Old Earth. Now it was ground down by the gun runs and leveled twice over by the bombardment over the past three days of this world's time. The wreckage made me nervous. Close. Too many hiding places. Too many crevices where a sniper could lurk. Too many dens where nests of warriors could lie in wait. Because if a shriek got within ten meters of me, my marines were fades and Terra burned. The resistance had melted away after the first weeks. Next day had been a bloodbath on a scale nothing but the industrialized carnage of the Terran war machine and the evolutionary specialization of an elite combat species could devise. But since that landing, the Shriek had burrowed their way into the crust of their world. 
into the tunnels and warrens and subterranean bunkers their engineers had constructed for just such an eventuality, planetary siege. My brother mused that we were fighting a war far more primitive than the enemy had engaged in for centuries. Laying under the shield domes before uneasy sleep, he surmised that the lack of FTL capabilities that confined our species to our surface also forced our planetary tactics to develop further than the Shriek. He pointed upward to a Valar one day, flying low and fast, with a belly full of marinis. They don't have any equivalent to a helicopter, he shouted over the rotors. We've seen thousands of dronies, massive fleets, even some fighters through the Atmo. But they're not used to moving armies on the surface. They fight within the void. Because once you control the void space, you control the world. But we can jump. Jump right past both fleets and orbital defenses. They don't know how to fight this kind of war anymore. They don't know how to fight isolated from their ships. I was less cerebral. They retreated into their bunkers because it took away our only advantage. Forced us into CQC against an elite combat species. Forced us to come in and take them before their fleets overran the masquerade of our jumps. The resistance had melted away. Nothing but drone networks and autonomous autocannon units against our advance. Until this city. I was almost glad. Every nerve had strained to the breaking point, exhausted by the anticipation of a battle that hadn't come. Almost glad. Almost. There was half a company's worth of soldiers dug into the rubble ahead. The reason my brother had halted. Heads down, helmets pulled low over their eyes. A few of them were spitting on rags and trying to clean their masks of grime. Soft, slow biology that couldn't survive even the atmo of this high oxy world. Sandwiched between two massive stone blocks fallen askew atop each other, a sniper stared through his scope, listening to the murmurs of his spotter. I liked snipers. Plasma weapons had some kind of exponential energy increase before the projectile destabilized. They were perfectly accurate, traveled faster, and required reloading once a century or so, as far as we could tell. But kinetics could reach just a fingertip further. My rifle's effective range was 1,200 meters. My sightline extended less than a score from where I stood. Too close. Range was our ally. Hey. Hey. Enhanced. I felt under the band of my helmet, came away with a crushed pack of smokes. Retrieved the last cylinder and put in between my lips. I didn't light it. Not yet. Hey. It was one of the Earthers. Fresh Marine folded into our company after half his own were on the wrong side of an ambush. The company hadn't had any enhanced, hadn't been protected, hadn't had a chance. I swept our six again. The rubble made me nervous. The sniper shifted almost imperceptibly. Range was our ally. I finally fixed the earther with a flat stare. Hey. He seemed nervous, suddenly. Do you sense any shriek? I swapped the cigarette to the other corner of my mouth. One of the other marines swore, loudly, and the heads all swiveled toward the noise. Speech was amplified easily by the headsets we all wore. Shut your mouth, fish. Cut the chatter, Lieutenant Briggs barked. My brother waved us forward. One by one, the marines darted across some kind of courtyard to join the soldiers and the sniper's nest. My brother stayed at the last corner until all our marines were in cover. Fish thinks we can sense shriek. I muttered to my brother as I passed him. After he darted across to join me again, he hissed back. Hopefully the Shriek think that too. I smirked briefly, matching my brother's half-smile. A thunderclap rolled across the surface from kilometers away, shaking the rubble and vibrating the stone under my feet. The artillery had hit something, probably another fuel cell depot. I brought my rifle up to stare at the blank windows of the fallen skyscraper through my optic. It's only the drugs make them good. I rolled the cigarette between my teeth, glancing sideways without lowering my rifle. This Marine was a little older, ragged from longer deployment, another one that got folded in. He was glowering at me while he spoke to the kid. Just the drugs that make him breathe this world like a Xeno. I dropped my rifle on its sling and lit the cigarette in response sucked down a lungful of carcinogens and felt the nicotine drain my migraine away. Been on the drip too long. Couldn't shut it off when everything was this close, though. When I had my marines with me. The soldiers we had just joined were staring openly. 
two maskless Marines, my brother in a mech suit that had him almost 30 centimeters taller than me. The mechs were exoskeletons designed to assist during heavy manual labor, destroyer armament and the like. A lot of the enhanced began wearing them after X-Day. Slow, bulky, awkward, but brutally strong. I preferred to keep my reflexes, even at such a strength disadvantage against the enemy. Well, guys, if you liked this video and want a particular HFY story, comment below with its title. Also, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. But most important, leave a comment. Until the next video.